Welcome to Disney Coast to Coast, a show celebrating and questioning one of the most beloved entertainment companies in the world through honest, passionate, and clear-eyed Disney discussions. I'm Jeff DePauli, your entertainment-obsessed host with rose-colored glasses removed. Welcome to the Season 9 premiere of Disney Coast to Coast. In honor of the occasion, I have a very special guest joining me on the show today. Have you ever had a Disney dream for yourself? Today's guest, Caitlin Robrock, certainly did. She dreamed of being the voice of Minnie Mouse for many years. Well, as they often say at Disney, dreams do come true, and it did for Caitlin. After the passing of Disney legend Rusi Taylor in 2019, who voiced the famous mouse for 33 years, Caitlin auditioned along with hundreds of others hoping to lend their voice to Minnie Mouse. For Caitlin, the magic ran deep in her as a longtime Disneyland cast member, as well as using her voiceover skills to be heard in Disney parks around the world. So how exactly did she go from being a character attendant in Walt's original theme park to voicing one of Walt's original cartoon characters? Find out directly from the source and enjoy my interview with Caitlin Robrock. Prepare for some insight. You've tuned in to an exclusive DCTC interview. Hello, Caitlin, and welcome to Disney Coast to Coast. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. It's so fun to be here. I'm excited to have you. Of course, most people know you these days as the voice of Minnie Mouse, but it goes way back before that when you started this crazy career of voiceover. And I am curious, do you remember the moment when you realized that voiceover was an actual profession? Gosh, that's a very good question. I knew I wanted to do whatever it was that made people laugh when I saw Aladdin as a wee little Caitlin. Um, and it, it really solidified because the years the year before we watched Hook for the first time, my brother convinced me, we're going to go see that instead of Beauty and the Beast. And that's when I knew I wanted to be like Robin Williams because he's making me laugh. He's making me cry. A lot of it was also, of course, the music because I'm a big music buff. And then the following year, he did Genie and Aladdin. And that type of unrestrained, no filter, just crazy off the wall humor that's the kind of thing that made me laugh and I wanted to make other people laugh. So I thought, okay, he's doing these cartoons. I know what a cartoon is and I know what the person behind the cartoon is supposed to do because my parents raised me on Disney and Looney Tunes and they said, this is Mel Blanc. He does all these voices. He's just goofing around, you know, and making money at it and having fun. And once it kind of clicked from all the, the whole time I was growing up of like, okay, somebody's able to do these things. So once it realized, okay, it's it's a profession, Robin's an actor, I have to be an actor, I got to figure out a way to come back around to do voiceover. Okay, interesting. So you knew from a pretty young age that like voiceover was a job. It was a human giving these characters voices. Mm -hmm. And okay, so you knew it at a young age. So you say it was seeing Robin Williams and Hook first that kind of got you into that world of I want to do what he does. So what was it about, you know, the genie in Aladdin that was like, I want to do that more than I want to do what he's doing in Hook? Or, or, or was it that you wanted to do the voiceover more? Maybe you just ended up there. Well, I, I didn't think about voiceover as the medium of which to deliver this acting. I wanted to be a vet when I was a kid. So okay. seeing Hook really changed it like, oh, I'm feeling a certain sort of way. And I want other people to feel that way when they're around me or talking to me. Or if I'm a part of their lives in that fashion, acting seems to be the way to do it. And voiceover, you don't have to get dressed for it. You don't have to worry about your makeup. But Cartoons pretty, cartoon color, and me likey color cartoon. So I think that was the biggest thing. Like, an I'll watch anything animated. And if you can make people feel that way through your animated film with just your voice and you're acting behind it, that's real power. That really has that power to touch your heart that way. I love that. Before we were recording, we were actually talking about both of our loves of theater. And yes. so you were kind of in that world as well. So you were introduced through film, then animation, then kind of fell into the love of live musical theater, but kind of realized that wasn't for you. And, and yeah, that, 
Yeah. It, it, it came about where, like, I'm seeing these Disney features and they had a lot of the making ofs. And you didn't see that with any other company. But all of the stars of these movies were trained Broadway singers and actors. Or for the most part, they were. Plenty were TV film actors. And I thought, oh, if I wanted to be a Disney princess, I should be a singer. And if you're a singer, you should be on Broadway. Okay, I'll go. I'll learn theater and go do a few Broadway shows. And then I'll come back. And it, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. <laughs> it, it does not. But you definitely I definitely feel that theater training is the strongest foundation of acting you can have for voiceover because you have to learn how to direct your voice out to your audience. Every night can be a different flavor. You cr you find new experiences on the stage the more you do it. And TV and film, it locks in like one performance that you experience. And if it's a good performance, you're set. But theater, there's something live about it, and you're seeing the reactions of your audience. You're hearing those laughs. You're hearing the tears, or you're you're hearing the gasps. And that just feeds your soul that you are really being an actor here. You're really connecting to your audience. And that's what voice acting all is, because it's just your voice. You know, it's so interesting, as you mentioned how Disney back in the day, they had the celebrities and the Broadway people doing the voices for these animated films. But one thing that was super kind of unique to... I don't this this might be an overstatement but kind of unique to like the 90s was they were bringing in voice actors and often having separate singers sing yes. the roles which is not so much the case these days but it was a really interesting time in my argument as a huge theater fan I was like okay I get it some of these people performing the roles might be better known names, but I'm like, there are so many talented people who can act and sing. Just let them perform the role and sing the role. And I'm kind of happy that they've gone more in that direction. That That's definitely the best avenue to aim for. And the acting should always come first because uh, the, the acting of the character, the speaking of the character, that's going to carry the movie. And your songs are the cherry on top. So if the absolute best actor for your role that embodies the character, that makes you feel that connection, if they can't sing, I don't think that should be a deterrent because there are singers out there who absolutely can also connect to the role and bring that beauty and that training that they can if it matches appropriately. All the better if you audition singers and if they're fantastic actors as well, then you, you're two for two. I don't think it should be a hindrance if persons can't sing because there is... We can always have a singing match for it. Leia Salong is the perfect example. She's Princess Jasmine and Mulan, and she does a gorgeous job. Whereas Linda Larkin's the speaking voice of Jasmine, and Ming-Na Wen is the speaking voice of Mulan. And those acting styles, they're just perfect. They may not have been able to have sung those roles, but it didn't detract from the movie at all. But to be to be able to act and sing, that's always a plus. I'm always amazed when the voice match of the singer is like so on point. I'm thinking Hunchback of Notre Dame, Esmeralda. I'm not sure who did the singing role, but it was not Demi Moore. It was singing not. Ah, uh, no. Oh. I'm pretty certain. Oh, now you've got me questioning myself. Now you, you got me questioning are you, are you myself. I thought Google? it was. I, the no. Google will tell me. Yeah, no, I'm pretty sure it's a different singing voice. And like Demi Moore has a very unique speaking voice. So to get a matched singing voice that actually is believable, to me, was really impressive. It says it was performed by Heidi Mollenhauer. Okay. I'm not familiar with that name. But yes. I'm impressed by her because, l listen, it's been how many years and, and even you were still convinced that it was Demi Moore singing that part. I really was, singing which that is part. perfect casting. I didn't yeah. know it was Brad Kane instead of Scott Weiner. Yeah. You know, or, and even singing, singing matches for matches work because Leia Salonga sang for Jasmine in the original movie. And then you have Liz Calloway, who is one of my favorite singers. She sings in the two sequel movies and mm. she's the Swan Princess. She's the singing voice of Princess Odette. She's the singing voice of Anastasia. So she's all over the map there too. And it's just that beautiful, pristine princess voice. Yeah. Now, long before Minnie Mouse for you with Disney, you actually had experiences doing voiceover for Disney in the parks. Can I you talk did. about some of those little random gigs you had? Yes. My goal is to be have a voice in every park. And Ooh. there's 12 parks. <laughs> so we're working on it. The very first thing I did was the talking windows on Buena Vista Street out in Disney California Adventure. We had talking windows on the street just like we do on Main Street. Mm. So I did some of those windows. It, it's a little hard to hear them 
uh, over the music. And sometimes they turn them off as well if there's special events happening. But I had that placement there. I've done some safety spiels for Tokyo Disneyland for their It's a Small World attraction. To keep your hands and arms inside the boat at all times, please remain seated and watch your children. And then a couple of safety spiels for Tokyo Disney Sea. That's three right there. To help out um, in Pandora in Animal Kingdom, I'm a lot of the female Navi that you hear in the backgrounds of the rides and the ambiance. And there was a, another set of talking windows in Hollywood Studios where I was part of a group that did like a dress shop for Person's coming in, we're going to get married. Oh, you shouldn't wear that dress. Oh, your grandmother loves that dress. And and I, I'm not sure the status of that one. And then, oh, in Paris, in their It's a Small World in Paris, I'm the little yodeling doll. Because they remastered the soundtrack, but a lot of the sound effects from our original track in Disneyland in California, you can't separate them from the music. Mm. So they reorchestrated the music in a grander scale, and they recreated all the sound effects, but they couldn't recreate the yodeler. So I went in and got to do a little of the... So okay, so, that was a lot of fun. So that's a kind of random gig. So how uh -huh. does a gig like that come about? Like, did you know that, the, get a call that they were auditioning yodelers for that specific project? Or was this like, oh, we've worked with you in the past. Can yes. you do this sort of thing? It was, um, let's see here. I took a lot of voice acting workshops and clinics to like help build my training, build up my reputation, build up your connections, like through Hope Levy and, and Mary Lynn Wisner's like Meet the VO Pros. It's classes like that. Like you meet fellow voice actors, you meet casting directors, you meet agents. So those things were a big, big part of my career growing. And I had taken a class with the head casting director for Disney Imagineering many, many years ago. And he's the one who brought me in. And I did the Buena Vista Street. I did the other shop windows. And he recommended me to the person in charge of casting singing for our theme parks, uh, Todd Holm, I believe. And so I went in and gave a few reads for a yodeler. And that's how I got it. Jeez. So, so you didn't really know what you were auditioning for other Not than exactly, yeah. but it exactly. But it helped because at the time I was working at Disneyland. So I'm very much in in the deep waters of all things theme park related. What did you do at Disneyland? Character hosting. Oh, so if nice. you go to see a character um, before before our closure, you would go see the character. There's a line for Mickey. Oh, I want to go get a picture and an autograph. Okay, well, I'll have Wait you stand in this line over here. And when it's your turn, have your book and camera ready. Were you Minnie Mouse's host? Oh, plenty of times. Oh, my God. Like, how insane is that for you? I was going to get into this later, but come on. You were Minnie Mouse's host at Disneyland. Mm -hmm. And now you are the voice of mm -hmm. Minnie Mouse. That's insane. Surreal. You want to know what else is surreal? Let's hear it. When we would uh, work over in Toontown, and we've got our character friends over in Toontown, there's a little section that Pluto often stands at. And there's a singing, a talking window where Clara Cluck is giving singing lessons. Mm. So I would always just kind of do... Because Rusey Taylor did Clara Cluck. And I'm now the voice of Clara Cluck as well. That is crazy. Like, I know. And the oh cherry man. on top, I used to help out Clara Cluck the character, if you know what I mean, in the parks. You were a friend of. I was a friend of Clara Cluck. And we, we took a dive one day, and I I think I'm done being friends, Clara. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Too funny. That's that's wild. So, I mean, you said your goal was to have a voice in every park. What, you've got about half of them? Just about. I think that was six, yeah. Half, I've got six down. Uh, wow. I was, very, I was close for Red, for Pirate Red, who's in our Pirates uh, of the Caribbean. Yes. But it's performed beautifully by Gray Griffin. Yeah. And then I had read for Rosita, the little tiki bird. Um, but it's Yeni Alvarez, and she is delightful. And we saw that show for the first time recently in, in a long time. And they say it in the show, I wonder where Rosita is. And like, oh, she's out in the tiki hideaway. She's waiting for her boat. And her, the boat she's waiting for, I forget the name of the boat, but it's a boat that's been discontinued. So she's, uh, forever, she's forever waiting for that's her boat. Funny. So I love that, like, when we bring that stuff together. It's yeah. such a fun little tidbit for Disney Files. Wow. Like so me. since... Since you've done voices all over the world then for the parks, how many of them have you like actually been able to go and hear yourself in person? None. I've never left the country. 
but what about Disney California Adventure and stuff? You've heard yourself Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. For sure. I've seen that for sure. And we're actually going to Disney World in April to go celebrate the 50th. So I'll, I'll look for my other things over there. But I definitely want to travel and go see Tokyo Disneyland and Disney Sea, and Shanghai Disneyland and Hong Kong Disneyland. I want to go to all the theme parks and of just course. see what life is like across the pond. Excellent. Excellent. Now let's get into some Minnie Mouse discussion. Of course, mm-hmm. we grew up with the wonderful Disney legend, Rusie Taylor, performing the voice of Minnie Mouse for 30 three years before she passed away in July of 2019. Now, from what I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, but I I heard that she had been ill. So was this a situation where they had you kind of training for this part, knowing that, you know, the day would eventually come or? No. uh, No. With with respects to her, there was just a time period where where she was unwell Mm -hmm. and a couple auditions had come in for other projects. And that was kind of my yellow flag like this audition would not be here for this project if she was unable to do it at the moment because they'll just wait, you know. Like Minnie Mouse audition. Uh, not not Minnie, no. Oh, okay. Other no. parts she did. It was gotcha. just it was it was other roles, and that was kind of my first clue that something might be up because this wouldn't happen. She does all her roles. We would not have a secondary voice do it unless there was a real reason. I did yeah. not. I definitely didn't ask anybody or, or kind of pry, but it it kind of gave me that little yellow flag, and then. A mutual friend of ours texted me the day after she passed and said, I wanted you to know because she was such a hero of yours before you read about it, kind of indelicately online, Rusi has passed away. And, you know, what happens beyond this, don't worry about it, don't think about it. You know, what will be, will be. Like, so definitely trying to, like, give me some consolation without freaking me out because this, this was a dream, but I didn't expect it to happen so soon. I wanted another 10 or 15 years. Who wouldn't? Yeah. And it was just such a surprise. And I definitely kept to myself about it. And when the audition came out a couple weeks later, I didn't tell anybody that I was reading for it. Tell me if I'm getting too personal here. But so this, right. it sounds like this person that called you was, were they hinting that like they were considering you for this role? Not like, not like that. Uh, they, they knew that I had, had worked on Minnie in the past in classes okay. and okay. and and I asked with permission, like, you know, this is a voice I'd love to practice for a sound matching class. I don't want it to be stepping on anyone's toes. I certainly don't want it to come off like I'm gunning for that role. But this person is very well versed in working with Rusi. So it's a fantastic opportunity to hear from your ears how close am I? am I am I am I getting that character integrity there? Is that feeling there? Just to kind of know. Okay. And then it, w- it was several months prior, so it, it came out of the blue. So knowing this person helped helped a lot to be like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm confident enough that when this audition comes, I can perform it to my very best. It will be heard officially by the people in charge. And after that, it's out of your hands. Now you said you were a fan of Rusi's. Is that because oh, yes. of Minnie Mouse, or was there any other, was there a other particular role that you loved of hers, or just her career in oh, general? Just everything. Like we yeah. watched, we I watched My Little Pony. We watched Simpsons from the day it first aired. We were allowed to watch it as long as we didn't talk about it at school the next day, so we didn't get in <laughs> trouble. But I was definitely aware of the same sounds of her of her range coming from various characters. So I, I definitely knew who she was growing up. And then for most of the time after the 90s, she she was only doing mini. But I was I've been aware of it like what a voice actor is for a long time. And thankfully, once the Internet came, you can finally start looking up. OK, who does these voices? This this character actor is phenomenal. Who are they? Like you can really learn about people that way. Since you were such a big fan, did you get to meet her at any, at any point? I did. I had a three-strike meeting, as I call it. There was a society function that I went to with some friends, like around 20, 2009, 2010 or so, and she was there, and she was walking away, so we all said hello and thanked her. Super brief, and I, was, I choked up, and I couldn't say anything. And then a couple years after that, she came to Disneyland to do what we call a cast conservatory, where the members of our entertainment department, they were able to meet persons who do entertainment outside of the parks, like through voiceover or Broadway or costume production, like like a- any type of entertainment connected business. You could have a person come in and talk about it. So she came in to talk to us. And I pulled every string in the book to make sure I had the night free to go do this. And I was finally able to like 
physically speak words and thank her for all the beautiful work she's done. And I was such a fan. And a friend took a photo. And it's the, <laughs> she looks so darling, but I've got like the tear stained eyes and the <laughs> rumpled hair and I'm hunched over. But it's like, you know, even though you look like that, you can tell there's love there. So, yeah. And f- several years later, we were at June Foray's memorial. Mm. And it's like, oh, I felt like such a fool when I met her that first time, like all crying and blubbery. And then my friend Katie Lee said, I'm going to introduce you to her properly this time. So now that I had some voiceover under my feet and I had been working at the park and we had several friends who were friends of many who knew each other, I was able to meet her and say, my name is Caitlin Robrock. I'm a huge fan of your work. Thank you so much for being here tonight. For It was a really nice meeting that way. That's awesome. I'm glad yeah. that you got to do that. That's really... Oh, I was very grateful for it. Really great. So so what was that audition process like? Was it something where there was kind of an open call or was it kind of secretive where they were bringing in people they thought might be able to handle it? Or do you know? I believe it was open call. Okay. So for sure, for certainly L.A. based voice actors, it could, I'm sure it also went out to New York or Chicago or Texas um, just because it's it's a wide net. It's a very specific voice. It was her natural voice for the most part. And you want to make sure you're hitting a voice like that as closely as possible. You don't want it too shrill or too high. You know, there's it's just kind of that perfect storm. I've practiced her voice for almost 15 years at that point. So I felt like I had a pretty good handle on it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's an interesting you know, this industry is crazy and there's a million reasons why things happen or don't happen. So just because you can do it perfectly or even if sometimes even if you are the best person for the job, you don't necessarily get it. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I I know we just met for the first time, but anybody listening to the show who's listened regularly knows that I am a stickler for voice matches. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. I am so impressed with your Minnie Mouse. Like I can, Thank you. I can say I can't tell the difference. Like it's it's spot on as far as if you can't tell the difference, I am doing my job correctly. Exactly. And, e- 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 and if you can tell the difference, not even from the sound, but the nuance or the acting, I'm yeah. not doing my job. So I need to bring all portions of many to the table, not just the sound. Yeah, because well, one of the things that's interesting is like you know. The generation we grew up with, with the Fab Mm -hmm. Five voices, that was the first time that they were really assigned voices. And now, what have we got, Bill Farmer at 35 years plus? I believe he's the longest um, voice of any given character. I think maybe even longer than Walt, because Walt started it, but then he passed it on to Jimmy. Yeah. So I think in the Disney history, he's the longest running actor for a voice of a character. Yeah, so we were kind of lucky to grow up in this generation of consistent voices. But before Mm -hmm. that, it was nothing like that. And now that, you know, um, people are passing on, it's like we've got we've now got to do this again for a whole other generation of people. But it's crazy because, you know, although the people we know as the voices aren't necessarily the first in my book, they are the voice because nobody did it longer than that it's it's an epitome voice it's one that resonates with you the most and yeah. uh, and and it, it's different for plenty of people like the godfathers of voiceover are mel blank and june foray we mm-hmm. know this sure. and as much as i love and adore them i've got actors that for me are like the epitomes of my voiceover experience so like b benaderet she was the original granny and witch hazel on looney tunes so that's where all my little old ladies came from was from her fantastic voice Mm -hmm. and then maurice lamarche and tress mcneil they're such huge parts of my childhood they're the ones who really connected with me in terms of my own comedy my own style what makes me laugh what makes me believe in this acting so those two have huge strong points just as much as rusi did you know, obviously, it sounds like you you clearly did study this voice for many years. You worked on it. You were ready. Yes. But did you feel like it was going to happen? Did you have, you know, a premonition or just a gut instinct that, you know what, this is the time it's going to happen? I purposely tried not to think that way okay. because I was so scared I'd jinx myself. Sure. And and that's why I was given very good advice when I first started out in voiceover. That was something I had been aspiring to do. And I had the 
the legs of doing that voice. And and high up people had said, I appreciate that you have that drive and that passion. But as there are voices for these characters at this time, it's best not to talk about them or showcase that out of respect for them, which makes a lot of sense. I don't want to be seen as coming off the boat and gunning for the job. It's just good to know, like, if you can do that voice, you never know what the future will hold. But definitely work on your own original characters, work on your own strengths and practice on your own time. So when the when the opportunity happens, you're meeting it head on with the very best of your abilities. The thing that's interesting for me, like as it obviously they're doing the right thing, like respecting Mm -hmm. these voice actors and stuff. But I will say from a business standpoint, I would think that, you know, if somebody hits a certain age or something, they would be like, you know what, it's it's time to, you know, the best way to perhaps get ready for the future is for you to train s- your, the next person. And I would just think from a business standpoint, that would kind of be a thing. But it is really interesting because nobody I've talked to has ever said that it's happened that way. It's always been like, a, nope, wait till something, t- wait till we need it and then just audition and it'll work. I, I see why you why you could see it that way. Uh, it, it's just, it comes from that place of respect for the person doing it and the love you have for these, the people who are doing the voices. Yeah. If they choose to step down or they know that it's their choice, like I'd like to start pulling away, then we can have that overlap where we can look for a newer voice, see if they want to be mentored, see, just that way it's out of respect. I, I think it, people would much rather like, let's have the auditions and let's figure it out with a little bit of time delay, then hurt our friend's feelings by saying, like, let's look for another person to start mentoring because it yeah. might make them feel like, is there something I'm not doing right or have has my voice changed? And, and that's can, a reality, I can see too. it both ways. It voices, is a reality. Voices but, change with age for certain, you know. But at the end of the day, there should always be a conversation about it. Like, if, if there's a concern anyone would have, definitely talk to your talent and see, like, what could be going on? Is it something we can adapt around or change? Uh, that's just my two cents on it. So, so listen, everybody listening who isn't in Los Angeles and thinks we're all cold-hearted jerks out here, <laughs> this this is just a bit of proof that you know, like like honestly though, they, that's a really respectful way of handling the situation. One that I think a lot of people not might not assume is the situation. And you really don't know all sides of the story unless you're in the industry and can see those different points of view. Yeah. So the the only advice I could give in that respect is if there's a character you absolutely love and you hope maybe to do that voice one day, you never know when that opportunity could come, if ever. And it's always good to, you know, take the time for yourself. Go ahead and practice that character. There may be a need for it in the future. Refine it, listen, study, ask questions about voice matching in general. But it is, I I pass on the same advice I was given. It's best to kind of keep it with yourself to, to grow it and nurture it so that when any opportunities would come, you're ready to go. And you didn't kind of put the cart before the horse, I guess that's the saying. Because I wouldn't have wanted to, you know, tell everyone, well, I do a great Minnie Mouse voice. Hopefully I can do it one day. And then I don't book it. I would feel very foolish if I did that. In addition, of course, to respecting our actors. But just making sure you're as humble as possible. You can be proud of what you do, but you don't want to be prideful. So I, I took that piece of advice to heart. I didn't tell anybody I was doing it except for like very close friends that this is a dream of mine. Here's the voice I like to play with. You never know. And the people I told, like, they're not going to spread it around town. And then when it happened, I I read, did the audition. I didn't tell anybody I was reading for it. And nobody asked me. So it's like, this is the best possible thing that could happen. And the couple of people who knew it was a dream of mine, they didn't even ask. Hmm. I think they were too scared. Like, what if she didn't, though? We don't want to open up a wound. Or what if she didn't get the audition? Like, you don't want to be the person who brings something sad into the harsh light of day. And so I didn't tell anybody. You know, it's interesting. I just realized you had said one of your first teachers was Bob Bergen, right? Yes. And he has a very similar story of like training and wanting to be Porky Pig. Of course, he has been for decades now, Mm -hmm. but similar situation where it was like he was, I mean, I think- He knew what he wanted. Yeah, he knew what he wanted. He went for it. But the insane thing is, is like, that is such- 
I mean, that's a long shot. When you're like, there is this iconic character that, you know, the voice is replaced once every several decades. Like, it's it's a long shot. So it's crazy to hear his story and your story that that was such a dream. And you made it a reality. Like, that's mm-hmm. that's just incredible. And I'm sure, I mean, you you, I know, recognize how insane and how awesome that is. And and I knew, and my friends kept me humble about it. So, like, we practiced the audition every night, and she said to me, my friend Emily, she said, are you prepared if you don't book this? And I said, I'm not. Honestly, I'm not prepared. I, I don't know what I would do or think or feel because it's something I've wanted for so long. It's something I feel so good about doing and being able to do. I just, I, I see nothing if I look into the future and she's not there. So it's best if I don't think about it or talk about it because it'll just drive me insane. And the callbacks enough were like super anxious. Like, how long does it take? How long do we do this? When's the next one? And it's it just was so many feelings and so many pieces of pressure on me at that same time. And luckily, I'm very blessed and very honored and, and lucky that I didn't have to face that type of future. Now, I'm obviously not going to ask you to name any names, but do you know who you were up against? I haven't a clue. Okay. I know that I know that hundreds of girls have read for it. Wow. Um, who wouldn't? Like this is a jewel. I've had a couple people send me their auditions. <laughs> I, I, I've told them like, I don't want to give you an opinion on it if if it's a, an opinion that might dissuade you or hurt you when I when I'm not someone who should be doing that. So wait a sec, they sent you their Minnie Mouse they auditions? They sent me their Minnie Mouse auditions. After you after, got the gig? After I got the gig. Well, what And for? I've also had, I, I think they wanted to know, like, how close would I have come compared to you? And, like, I can't I can't give you that answer. Or that's, are they trying to kill you? That's for our casting director. Like, what, well, <laughs> we, could ask the, we could ask the people on Instagram who have DM'd me saying, do you have Disney's contact? I just want them to know that I'm here and that I do a fantastic <laughs> Minnie in case you ever get sick. Or if you can't make it one day, I could help fill in. And I remember reading that one and like, I, what do I say? And my mother's like, don't answer that. Just leave it alone. If, if, if you don't accept the message, it'll never be read on their end. Just, it's like you didn't get it. This, is, this, this account's run by someone else, a PR person. <laughs> and, so, and then the message disappeared one day. I'm like, okay, I don't have to deal with that. That's amazing. But it, it happens quite frequently. I have people messaging me, offering to help me. It's just these are not questions I can help you with, my dears. You got to go through the the process. Yeah, it's it is it is interesting because voice actors or actors in general are the people audiences know the most. Mm-hmm. It, they think performers have way more power than they do. Like they do. it comes down to producers, casting, and directors. Mm-hmm. Don't go after the actor they they're wanting the same information and same gigs that you do right yeah. like the the person writing this so it is it is kind of interesting but it makes sense like you know performers are the face of the business so mm-hmm. it makes sense but and like they'll listen to you like will they <laughs> not really yeah if they would listen to me i'd have a lot more gigs <laughs> sometimes you'll have guest characters on a show or you you might be aware that they're looking for some voice for this and if you know someone who might be a good fit, it's always okay for us actors. We can recommend like, I'd, you know, this audition is going out. I'd love to recommend this person if you haven't heard them already. I think they'd be a great fit. And it's up to them if they choose to listen to an audition or bring them in. It never hurts to offer. But at the end of the day, it's not it's not in my hands. Yeah. But we had, we had seven girls at the first callback. Uh, myself plus two from my agent. I knew that. But I didn't know who the other ones were until like much later. And fun fact, one of them was the beautiful Elise Willis, who is the one of the composers of the Mickey Mouse shorts with her husband, Chris Willis. Ah, and so oh, she's worked, yes, yes, she's yes. worked with Rusi for years. She sings all the time on the shorts. And she actually helped do some scratch track before I was brought in for some just like prelay for shows. And there wasn't enough time to... Um, to re-record a Halloween show in 2019. So her voice is the voice you hear for Minnie when you listen to that stage show for the Oogie Boogie Bash Halloween party. Uh, Or or was this Mickey's Not So Scary? Or in Florida? No, not in Florida. Out here in California. Okay. But we heard that show and she did such a cute job. 
She has all that nuance. She had all that sparkle. Like there was the absolutely, I could see why she was brought back for our So wait a sec. So between Rusi and you, there is one thing where somebody else is performing mini? Just for that hot second, yeah. Wow. That's kind of fun, interesting. Huh. It's it, it's cute. I, and I think they I think they reused it for this year's Halloween show, but I'm yeah, not sure. That's really... I I never re-recorded it. So, I if they used that same show this last Halloween season, she's in there. It's a what fun little Easter egg. What show was this? You said for Oogie Boogie Bash? I'm a, I don't remember the name of it, but I'm it's like to think the a show it's, that a, it's a little in. stage show that Mickey and Minnie are in and they're oh. showing off their costumes. In the Disney Junior stage, yes, I think. In that oh, okay, one. wow, fascinating. So, so that's hers. That is all her. Fascinating. And she's darling. She's such, and she's with the LA Choir. She's a phenomenal singer. Yeah, you said that this is her and her husband do the music for the the Mickey the Mouse Mickey shorts, shorts and right? Wonderful yeah. World of Mickey. They've written some amazing songs. They're well, they, so they did catchy. the Nothing Can Stop Us Now. I mm-hmm. don't know how. That, On that the new ride. earworm. Yeah, from Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway. Wow. Yes. Wow, that's fascinating. I hadn't heard that, and, and now I'm geeking out over that. That's super, super fun. Oh, they're the nicest people. They're so much fun. But we, we had, we she was part of our seven, I believe. Oh, gosh, if she wasn't, I'm going to sound like such a fool. <laughs> I didn't actually ask her this. Maybe I should have. But regardless, there were seven of us for our first callback. And then for the third callback, it was me and two others. And I was the only one from my agency. But I I never knew the names of anyone else. And a part of me was like, how close did they get? How good were they? And like, don't think about that. Uh, It doesn't matter. You got the job. (laughs) But I'm still proud of them as well. Like, it's a hard voice to do. It's, It's a beautiful role. We all loved the woman before us. So... I hope they. I hope they all felt good. Like you know, we made it to that top. Yeah. Because I I've been in of several callbacks and like or second callbacks and like could it possibly be me and someone else books it? But it's still a great feeling that you got that far, that they remembered you and brought you in. It can it could always beget more work in the future. You never know. Well, that's the that's so true. Like the amount of times you end up getting gigs off of other things you auditioned for Mm -hmm. that you didn't get is crazy. The other thing that's so weird in this industry is like, listen, we all want to get the gig because we all want to be able to say, hey, I got that gig. But like the, the crazy part of this industry is even if you got as far as, you know, auditioning, getting in front of the right people, being called back, I'm like, that accomplishment is insane. That is an accomplishment that most people who would go for that, don't get. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to like, you know, it's something that just you really know. Because even if you tell people in your family or real world people, they're like, people look at that as, oh, you didn't get the job. I'm like, yeah, but I got four callbacks. Like, do you know what that means? There's a saying that Bob always said, and it took me a while to get what he meant and, and and that happens with Bob any Bergen. teacher. Bob Bergen, yes. Yeah. And that happens with any teacher because I've I've had Richard Horvitz, I've had Mick Wingard, I've had Bob Bergen, I've had Charlie Adler. Like I've I've studied with several persons, and a lot of the times, you know, they'll give you that same piece of advice, and you think you get it, but then there's one day you're reading or performing, and something clicks, and you get, that's what they mean. You know, you got to feel something internal to really get it. And one thing Bob always says is, just because you didn't book the role doesn't mean you didn't get the role. So when you have a second or third callback and there's you and three others, that means any one of you three could carry the show. You all brought something wonderful to it. You're all phenomenal actors. And each of you could make this character be the best they could possibly be. But there can only be one. So even if you didn't get picked and it was for whatever deciding factor, as hard as it is, like you were there. Mm-hmm. It may not have actually happened, but all the pieces were there except one, which means it could happen again. And it means that you understood that character. You did your job exactly the way you should have. You may not have booked it, but you got that character. So if this character archetype comes down the line, you're golden. You will have submitted an audition that you are phenomenal at, you're comfortable with. It's an organic part of you, and you can stand by it. That's awesome. That carries you through when all the rejection and failure feels like it's weighing you down. Of which there is a lot. percent <laughs> is a no. Yeah, we're I, I insane. Mean, People in this industry are insane. <laughs> like, it's insane. <laughs> oh, man. But, you know, crazy. and, and it's, it's hard sometimes because, 
a, a lot of our wonderful talent, they book roles because they have fantastic reputations. They've got great resumes and you can trust them. You're going to have fun with them. And it's a good bet. It's it's just it's hard sometimes for people to like take a chance on newer talent because you want to make sure you're doing the best. Yeah. But the more you keep working on it, the more you build up your reputation, do little one off characters and then you do some tertiaries or secondaries like it, it'll grow. It's that time and that patience. Yeah. It's a long it's a long run, not a sprint. And it took me. 15 years from when I started to honest and for truly work towards voiceover till mini. And Mm -hmm. it it took me, I think, seven years before I had my agent, six years until I actually like booked real roles on shows. And then, you know, three after that until I had mini. So it's a long process. If I can do it, anybody can. Well, I don't know about that, but... (laughs) Well, yes, okay. (laughs) So, so you got Minnie Mouse. You got yes. the gig you're dreaming of. What is the first official job that you do as Minnie Mouse? We did these little interstitials that was on, I see them on YouTube. They're little claymation interstitials for holiday time. And like one of them, they find a mysterious bag in their cabin and it, it holds all of Christmas magic. And one time they bring in a bunch of snow and they realize, oh, the snow has melted. And Mickey says my favorite line, now it's just a wet floor. (laughs) (laughs) It's my favorite thing he says. And then they learn how the the magic of Christmas can freeze it, and now you can ice skate on it. So those those were the very first two things I went in for. Uh, Side note, I thought it was a third callback when I went into it. I didn't know it was the gig until I got there. Oh, my God. That was Wait a like, second. Okay, so, yeah, I, I figured this would happen. So your realization of you got the job, you are Minnie Mouse. It was, did not happen like any fantasy. I envisioned my agent would call me and go, Kitten. How did they not? How did they not call you? Well, what happened was I had done the first call back, worried my butt off for a week, panicking. It was the week of D23 Expo, so everyone mm. had all hands on deck on the Expo. Which makes a lot of sense. They don't have time to like circle back just yet. We got to get through this huge thing. And here I am thinking, oh God, what if they passed? Oh, like, like just worrying my butt off. And then the following week, I get a call for the second call back. And like you could just feel my shoulders breaking off from the tension. And we go in and do the second call back. And it's very much just like the first call back. And there was, you know, pauses while they're discussing with other persons on the phone. They're discussing amongst each other. And at that point, you just, okay, tune out and think of dinner. (laughs) You know, don't freak out. Just tune out and think of dinner. And afterwards, they said, thank you so much, Caitlin. We're going to send you to Disney television next week. Please, you know, have a wonderful night. Thank you again. And I said, thank you so much. And I I said, oh, my gosh, I got a third callback right out the gate. They're going to bring me in. Like, I don't have to work. They don't have to decide. That's so cool. So the following week, I go in, looking cute, thankfully, and I'm ready for a third callback. And the young lady who's assisting us hands me a stack of papers to sign. And I was like, why would we sign? Oh, I bet it's a non-disclosure. We can't talk about auditions, right? She goes, oh, no, honey, this, this is the job. And then no. she looks over like, oh, they're actually ready for you. We'll sign these later. Go ahead on in. So she tells me that. And I didn't have a moment to panic. I didn't have a moment to freak out. But I didn't have that fantasized moment of like the blessed phone call and the 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 artful tears that I would cry I was just like I I got it and I walk in and there's 15 people there instead of like our normal three or four and like I've never half of them I'd never seen before and never saw again so I think everyone came in to like let's make sure this is right Caitlin I am getting crazy (laughs) chills right now listening to this story I, that, so wait a sec, did they know that that was the moment that you were going to find out that you were mini, or did they think they told you already when they said you go I to Disney I think they all TV? assumed, oh, she knows she got it. Oh, like, my God. This I, and I, I told, like, the, the higher-ups later, like, yeah, I didn't know. Like, there was a just there was some kind of miscommunication. I what did you say to your back. agent the next time you talked to your agent? Like The same thing, like, hey, Sandy, um, it wasn't a callback today. Like, I thought it was the gig. And she had called back and said... Oh, yeah, honey. Didn't I tell you? Are you kidding and like, me? Well, I think she 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 was very busy helping her mother out with some, you know, just outside of work things. So, yeah. it, or if she did, I must have hardcore blue screen <laughs> and missed it entirely. That's not out of the realm of expectation either. 
but I definitely, I was driving home and like, I feel so many emotions and I don't know which one to pick. Well, you've been thinking about dinner all doing that callback, so go get yourself some dinner. And I treated myself to like a grand spread at P.F. Chang's because I deserved it. I don't know how you did the job. I would have been like, I need a good 20 minutes because like this, this is insane. Like at that point, as I was walking in, like literally it's like you've wanted this for years. You've literally walked the walk. So now it's time to literally talk the talk. Seriously. You're here for this reason. And Dave Wright was there. He's one of our head casts at Disney Television. And Jen Trujillo was there. And I knew both of them. They knew me. They knew my reputation. They knew my work ethic. I knew my engineer and the director. Like, I know these people. They brought me here. They trust me. And Dave popped his head in like, we didn't know they'd all be here, but don't be nervous. You're going to do great. You got this. So he, he gave me that blessing and because I had gone to a callback for Muppet Babies before, which was my first ever callback. And I was a sweaty mess for Baby Piggy. I just so nervous, but I wanted it so bad. But like, you know what? You you already had that first callback jitter. So even if this were a callback, don't get those jitters. You're a professional. They hired you. Show them why. So I focused only on Kelly, my director. We did our lines. I cracked a few jokes to show that I'm, I'm hip and cool and, and on the fleek. We can have fun together. <laughs> Wow. And we, we got done within like a half hour. So showing, hey, I'm expedient. We're not going to waste any time trying to get me to a place you want the acting to go. I, I give three different reads every time. So if you had a different emotion in mind, here's three. So it, hel- it helps to speed up the time too. But we did it all. They said, thank you so much. We'll see you next week. I came out. I thanked everybody for having me. It was It, it was truly an honor. And of one of the happiest moments of my life. Have a wonderful week and take care. And then I got out of there. Wow. I didn't know that story at all. My Not many is... people do, but uh, now they will. Well, now they will. I mean, have you told that story in interviews before? Have I? Uh, you're one of my first interviews, actually. I've, I've done a couple before. Okay. Well, I am so I'm, excited I'm for people pretty, to hear this. I'm still this. pretty fresh. I hope that people are getting mega chills. Like, I'm... I'm so happy for you hearing that story that I know was like years ago for you at this point, but it's new for me. And oh my gosh, uh, my mind. Well, is I certainly get those feelings of like, is this was this truly meant to happen? All those little pieces falling into place make it seem like it is. But you got to oh. be humble. Don't don't assume because if yeah. if I assume something or if I get prideful, that's when irony will come in and kick me in the butt. So yeah, and I cool. didn't want to risk anything with such a precious and pure character. Yeah, no, you know, of course, there were some series that Rusi had worked on, like Mickey and the Roads to Racers, that I think that you mm-hmm. end up doing as well, right? For those, uh, for those, uh, R- Roads to Racers was our first two seasons of that of that show, and then the third season of Roads to Racers had a different title. It was called Mixed Up Adventures. Okay. So it was the exact same show, just had a title change and less focus on the races. Mm-hmm. So I, that's why it wasn't Roads to Racers anymore. There's not many races. And so there were plenty of episodes Rusi had done, but due to her illness and due to the time spent, hope, you know, hoping for her to get better, there's pickup lines, which is lines they want to change before they animate because the animatic didn't quite line up appropriately, or ADR, which is um, additional dialogue replacement. There, it means a lot of things, so I'm going to stick with that one, where like we've animated the line we want, but you, but Rusi only said the first half of the line, we need the second half. Gotcha. So I would fill in where they'd play her line, and then it didn't happen too often, but they'd play her line, and then I'd jump in to finish the line. So some a couple of lines are amalgams of both of us. And then most of the time it was like, let me hear what she performed, how she said it, and then I'll repeat it and then finish the line. So we had some overlap there, and she's still credited as many, and I'm additional voices. Oh, okay. So I start I started performing on the episodes, and I had that small credit where I'd pop in. And then at, at some point eventually, from the ground up episodes, that's when I took over officially. And you did quite a bit for the Disney Junior stuff. You've got Mickey Mouse Funhouse, Minnie's mm-hmm. Bow Tunes. But then you worked on The Wonderful World of Mickey Mouse, which is a different style. This is the style that yes. we see in something like Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway at Disney's mm-hmm. Hollywood Studios. Now, is there a difference in your performance or a, the way that you attack it or the way that you approach the voice considering, you know, J- Disney Junior versus this kind of more adult cartoon? Yes, I had done uh, work on Adult Swim for Mr. Pickles, so I know a lot of that older audience, 
and for our for our children's audiences, most everything is pretty straightforward. We're gonna ha- we're Minnie's the eye of the hurricane, so sh- her voice is a little bit lower, just to have kind of a softer maternal tinge to it for our little ones, and. They deal with their situations very ABC, laid out so everyone understands what's our situation in this episode, what's the lesson we're learning, how do we help our audience as well as our characters achieve that lesson. So I, I, we, I keep it simple and sweet and not too zany, not too wacky. You know, that whenever they're scared or angry, it's very light, just a bare dusting. So it gives the kids a, a basic a foundation to grow up with. And then for Wonderful World of Disney, that's way more wacky and zany and, and like, what is your instinct as an actor telling you to do mm. with your comedy sense and your timing and your, your envisioned ways of saying things in your character voice? So those shorts allow you to just go all out. One of the things that I saw some of your early credits as Minnie Mouse, I, you know, my favorite thing when it comes to animation is holiday specials. Yeah, and you hit two of the biggies right out of the gate. You did Mickey's Tale of Two Witches, yes. as well as Mickey and Minnie Wish Upon a Christmas. Yes. I do. Are you like me? Did you love holiday specials, animated holiday specials growing up? Like I'm obsessed with them. Oh yeah, all the Rankin Bass ones. Mickey's Christmas Carol is huge. Oh, God, so many. Um, the Duck the Halls one for the for the Mickey shorts. There are so many. Well, what was it like? Knowing like those were some of your early gigs, like because t- to me, I know a lot of stuff that you record. You know, kids will watch when they're kids. But that might just be it. But like a holiday special, at least for me, I still watch those kids' holiday specials. So there are people growing up with this that like those are going to be with them for the rest of their lives if they watch that it That makes annually. me so happy. Yeah. Like, did I don't know. That would have been super exciting for me to do a holiday special. I was excited because I, I think I bear the most of the singing. You do a ton of singing in the Christmas mm-hmm. one. So that stage, that stage and musical training paid off, even exactly. though I didn't go to Broadway. I can still <laughs> sing. And sometimes sometimes it's easier to sing in character than your own natural voice, because to this day, I still don't even know what is my natural singing voice best suited for? Is it a pop voice? Is it a ballad voice? Is it a Broadway voice? Is it? A, I don't know. Yeah, well, we it works for Minnie Mouse. And- it does. And that's what. That's what matters. And that's what matters right now, right? Exactly. So that's so cool. Now, are there any theme park rides or shows that you've done as Minnie Mouse yet? Are you in Runaway Railway or? I am not. Runaway Railway recorded, I believe, in like 2018, 2017. It recorded er much earlier because for for projects like these, you want to get the recording down because they have to program and animate all the animation that's involved in the ride to those voice tracks, as well as programming any animatronics to those voice tracks. Mm-hmm. So th- those had to come first, for sure. And then the rest of the ride was built around it in the existing building where they could see what is our limitations. And then the version in Disneyland they're building, it's built. It's being built from the ground up. And that's why it's taking longer than anticipated. I believe it's going to open next year. It's somewhere around there, but just because they got to make sure everything is set in place. There's nothing pre-existing to go off of. If if they had any need to adapt, change, or adjust anything in the ride, they could call me in to say, you know, we, we'd, we'd love to have Caitlin in to help these portions of it. So is there anything in the parks that you've done as Minnie Mouse? Ah, uh, not in Disneyland, but we have. Oh, by the Disney way, that's World. how you're going to get into all the parks. You said your dream was to be in all 12 parks. You're Minnie Mouse. Of course, you're going to be in all 12 parks really soon. There's always shows, parades, everything, right? Al- almost. It depends on the park. So I, I've done. Oh, my gosh, you're right. So I have done a lot more for Paris than I thought. Because <laughs> in, in, I do I do mini for Paris, Disneyland. Um, a lot of characters are are French as well. So mm-hmm. like Mickey out there will always be French. He is he is uh, the ambassador of the theme park for that country. He speaks French. Minnie out there speaks English. And it, it just it bounces back and forth depending on the character. And then in Tokyo, I believe I believe for the, for the most part they have their own voices as well for their theme parks. But I have done dialogue and singing for the Big Band Beat show which I believe is in Tokyo Disney Sea. So it, it, it does pop in and out uh, from each theme park, depending on what they need. I have faith you're going to hit those 12. No problem. 
I have <laughs> total faith. Um, so Disney's Not So Spooky Spectacular, the Halloween show at Magic Kingdom that was new in 2019. Is that you? I don't believe so. Okay. Aquamouse? Are we going to hear you on the yes, Aquamouse? Yes. I want to go on that way? ship so badly. <laughs> I, I want to go on that ship so bad. I have a feeling you'll be able to get there. Um, I want okay. to. <laughs> so you as Minnie Mouse will be on the Aquamouse when the Disney Wish sets sail. Aquamouse is there. There's a couple shows for the Wish um, that will be a premiering with the boat ride. Uh, wow. Boat ride. I'm sorry. It's Yeah, it's a boat ride. This little cruise is a boat ride. But there's <laughs> there's a couple shows that will be there for our, our passengers to enjoy. There's a couple shows coming out in, Dis- in Magic Kingdom for them to enjoy. So hopefully, and hopefully that one will be out when we're there because I really want to see it. Awesome. But ju- to be safe, I'm not going to say what because you never know what'll change. And but there, there's always new stuff coming, especially with the 50th. Excellent. Now you've worked on various other Disney projects, including Amphibia, Doc McStuffins, Frozen Two, and What If Thor Were Only Were an Only Child. But is there a Disney dream project that you'd love to work on that obviously isn't Minnie Mouse? Hmm. Or a ride, perhaps, that you'd love to hear your voice on. Rides are so unique in and of themselves. It'd be lovely to voice an original character for a ride, like how they created Red for Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah. If they added any new rides in our Disney future or any ideal characters as part of that loop. But I, I know the persons who are involved in that, so it's it's the best possible opportunity to try. But if I have a bigger Disney dream than what I've got, I would love to to sing an Alan Menken original song mm. somehow. I, I'd love to be um, a character in a Disney film, not just our looping, but a, a character with a name and a, a story arc in that show, a song or two to sing. It'd be lovely. To, it doesn't have to be a Disney princess, of course, but a, a character that could really live that test of time in an animated film. Oh, Caitlin, I want to hear you as a Disney diva villain. That's what I want. Ooh, I would I would love to do something of that nature. It just depends what the future will hold. But villains have the most fun. Is it more fun for you to create your own character or take over an icon role? Very different things. Both have their pluses and minuses. But is there one that you prefer? I've loved Minnie for so long, and I knew that's who I wanted to to be a part of. I wanted to be a part of that legacy with this character. Because Minnie is a character that... You know, she's a character I would have strived to be like. I'm more of a Daisy than a Minnie, but it's fun because this is the sweet. This is the sweetest character. You can trust her. She's a friend to all. It, it makes me feel good being her voice because it's making her good for all of our audiences. If if I can touch people that way, I, there is no greater feeling. But original characters as well. Original characters often are, they're so close to you as yourself, not the idealized version of a character you might be taking over for, but a character that you can channel all aspects of yourself. You can make like, oh, this character, this is Caitlyn with a mustache, or this is Caitlyn if she got jilted at the prom and now she's a villain. You can bring your comedy to it. You can bring accents to it if you love accents. If accents can make you feel a, a, a completely different person, because I've known plenty of Southern persons who sound as sweet as sugar, but what they say isn't so sweet. <laughs> like, oh, hello, Mary Lou. Are you wearing that to the outfit to the prom? That's a nice choice. Do you have any others? No? Well, I'm sure you tried your best. You know, <laughs> bless, bless your little heart. So Southern can be so genial. And then at New York, I could go on and on about accents, but New York, you can be like, I'm not being mean. I'm being honest. There is a difference, okay? My mother told me this, and I'm going to tell you. That color is not your color. It's my color. So how about you hand it over? I'm just being honest. I'm not being mean. I'm being honest. You clearly enjoy doing voices. You know, I I've, do. I've got to say... The people haven't heard Minnie on the podcast yet. Do you mind doing a little Minnie or do you like to just keep that for work? I mind quite a bit and I am insulted, you would ask. Uh, let's see. What have we done that's really fun? Oh, you know what? I'll tell you this. The first time I ever realized I had that ability to do Minnie was I was working at Disneyland and the Christmas parade came in. And when it comes into where our cast members are resting, a lot of the times the same cues 
play when it passes the gates. So I learned it because I knew the cue for Mickey and Minnie so often, I just started repeating it because I'm going insane. So Mickey comes in and he'll, he says like, isn't it a beautiful day for skating? And then Minnie goes, oh, it is, Mickey. Watch me twirl. Oh, <laughs> I love a winter holiday with you. Hello. And then she waves to the guests. That's so, wonderful. So that's how I, I just kind of mimicked exactly what her cue was. And then my coworkers who were with me that day were like, you sounded just like her. That was That's insane. And I thought, do I now? Well. <laughs> Let me work on that that's one. That's a little. A, we'll put a pin in that and see what happens there. Nice. Yeah. Excellent. Now, I have noticed that when a voice actor performs the role of one of the Fab Five, it often becomes their identity. They'll have it posted all over their website or social media Mm -hmm. that they are the voice of whichever character. But I have noticed that although you certainly recognize the fact that you are the one and only voice of Minnie Mouse currently, you don't really promote yourself that way. And I was wondering, is this a strategic move or do you feel like she's not really yours yet? What's the reasoning for this choice or have have you just not updated your website at all (laughs) oh i have that's a new website actually um with minnie having worked at disneyland for so long that that i i do believe that was a factor in helping them choose to cast me because i've i'm part of that disney family in this respects i know what this character means to people because i've literally seen it in front of me at the parks where, where guests and children can meet the characters. That's the bridgeway between the movies we love and the TVs we love and how you feel about them. That's the bridge where you can go and see this physical in front of you representation of what you love and connect with them. So I know how important that is. And the character integrity we have for these characters, that comes first. That's why we love them so much because we want to believe in that magic. So to be a voice of the characters, I love to talking about it and representing it, especially in our Disney arenas, like, you know, D23 Expo or articles or our TV shows. But a lot of it is certainly like, I don't want to talk about it too much because little kids can, they know how to work that internet. And we don't want to spoil that magic for them that this character is, is a lady in a closet. <laughs> and I, I, you know, it, you never know how long something will last. And I, I want to just ride that wave and enjoy what I have. And, and let Minnie speak for herself. And I'm, just, I'm, I'm right behind her, giving her all the support I can. And I figure it's just, let's be safe than sorry. Let's yeah. let her be her. And then when we're in the appropriate circles where we're all in on that magic, we all love learning about that aspect, that's where we can shine and talk about it. But in our general day-to-day, she should be the focus, not me. Excellent. I love you that. You can focus on me for other stuff. <laughs> I'll talk about everyone else. Well, before I let you go, uh, in a couple days after this episode's released, we have the wonderful winter of Mickey Mouse being released on yes. Disney+. Plus. Tell me a little bit about this, because at the time we're recording, I haven't seen this yet. It's not out. It comes out on February 18th on mm-hmm. Disney+. Plus. So it's, is this all, was this like a compilation of some older stuff, or is this all 100% brand new? This, I believe, is season two of our wonderful world of Mickey Mouse, but mm-hmm. we are, we're using it in seasonal chunks now. So the wonderful winter of Mickey Mouse will be uh, three or four cartoons that are based in the season of winter. And we'll have an exciting special of sorts, like a 20, 30 minute special about winter. And then in a few months down the line, we'll have one about spring, one about summer and one about fall. And they're all very funny, very delightful. Oh, I want to tell you so many things, but I just can't. (laughs) But they're, they're definitely perking up. They're, 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 they're going to, I think they're going to make you smile. Excellent. Now, before I let you go, I feel it is my duty to let you know that in doing my research, I discovered, you're not going to believe this. I'm adopted? We are oh. married in an alternate universe. You and we I are. are married in an alternate universe. One of your earliest credits as ADR voice match for uh, Melissa McCarthy in the movie The Boss. True? Mm-hmm. I remember okay. that. Yeah. Well, believe it or not. I am the ADR voice match for Melissa's real-life husband, Ben Falcone, in that same movie. His That's character. funny. How wild is that? That's funny. <laughs> I like that a lot. Uh, Melissa is so funny. And that movie's great. 
she does all her own ADR. And yeah. but there was a situation she couldn't do her ADR for this project when it was needed for like airplane flights. So you want to you want to clean up our airplane flights. So I went in and did it for that. But she's got such a unique voice. So I say, like, if you can do your own ADR, do it, girl, because your voice is perfect as is. Yeah, I was I went in for like an announcer part. They needed to re-record an announcer. So I'm just talking like this as an announcer. And then they're like, mm-hmm. oh, man, we got this other part. Can you can you match this? And I I had to say, like, you hit me in the throat, you witch or something like that. Yeah, she, she and- pops him in the throat when she walks by. Yeah, so I, uh, I would, yeah, her real life husband. I am his voice match in that film. How funny! That's funny. Is that? When I saw that on your resume, I just about died. I was like, "This is hilarious and insane." But uh, in any well, case, this is not supposed to be about me. It's about you, and I just—it wanna... is about me. And you're several years late on anniversary gifts. I want a divorce. <laughs> I just want to say congratulations. I'm so happy that, you know, the voice of Minnie Mouse has gone to somebody who loves the character so much, clearly deserves it. You have worked hard and trained for a long time to Thank get you. this part. And uh, I'm so happy for you. And I've loved these stories. And I really appreciate you coming on to talk on the podcast on one of very few interviews you've done since, you know, getting this role. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. It's been fun. I like it here. Thanks for tuning into this episode. Don't miss any future episodes by subscribing and following Disney with a Z coast to coast on your favorite podcast app. If you enjoy the show, consider supporting it at no extra cost to you. There's a darn good chance that you already use Amazon.com quite a bit. Did you know that if you simply click on the Amazon link in any of the Disney Coast to Coast episode descriptions every time you shop on the site, you'll be helping support this very podcast at absolutely no additional cost to you. It's a win-win scenario. Simply do your regular shopping on Amazon, but instead of typing in the URL, click the link in this episode's description. You just need to place your order within 24 hours of clicking the link. So every time you're headed to Amazon, whether it's for something fun or simply mundane daily necessities, click on the link in this episode's description to help ensure more free episodes of Disney Coast to Coast. This episode has been executive produced by Robert Scontrino. Gain rewards like Robert, including access to episodes you can't hear anywhere else and live stream Q&As. Simply click on the Patreon link in this episode's description. Basically, anything you need can be found in this episode's description. From additional information discussed on this episode, to the DCTC hotline where you can leave a voicemail and be heard on a future episode, access to the show's official website, some free gifts from me to you, and so much more. So be sure to check out this episode's description. Other than that, folks, have a magical day. Bye! Thanks for listening to Disney Coast to Coast! Have a magical day! <laughs> Disney Coast to Coast is produced and hosted by Jeff DePauly. Learn more about the podcast and become a supporter at DisneyCoastToCoast.com. This podcast is part of the DePodcast Network. Learn more about this show, plus find more quality and entertaining podcasts at DePodcastNetwork.com. That's D-E-PodcastNetwork.com.